Well, it's good to be with you again to share from God's Word, and we trust that your heart is prepared to hear what He wants to share this morning. I think you know by now that I have a deep concern about the American church. That concern has not developed overnight, it's developed over decades, and it has been increasing as time goes on. As I look at the overall health picture of the American church, well, it just so happens that this week George Barna, one of the probably most reliable and best of Christian researchers and pollsters, has completed an exhaustive study, and uh, the results are in. It's what we've known. It's what we've sensed. It's what we've kind of seen on the landscape of the American church for some time. But I tell you what, when I think of these things and I read such reports, it deeply, deeply saddens my heart. Do you know that today as we meet, 52% of evangelical Christians I'm not talking about 52% of Americans. I'm not talking about 52% of people who call themselves Christians. I'm talking about 52% of evangelicals. I've been an evangelical all my life. I believe in those foundational truths of the gospel of Jesus Christ. 52% of evangelical Christians deny the infallibility of the Word of God. They believe that the Bible from cover to cover is not necessarily absolute truth. 43% of evangelicals in America believe that Jesus sinned during his lifetime. 58% of evangelical Christians believe that the Holy Spirit is only a symbol. Now you might understand why I asked you at the beginning of my preaching to please bring your Bible and even a notepad and let's get in to the Word of God because I tell you what, I have sensed for decades that the American church is becoming biblically illiterate. And the conclusion of George Barnum is that we need a new reformation in the sense that if you go back to Martin Luther, the reformation was all about let's get away from all of these man-made rules and let's get back to the Bible. Well, it's time to get back to the Bible because Evangelical beliefs are being shaped by the secular culture more than they are by the Word of God. Did you hear that? That's a tragedy. And I know that we are interested in our own health, our own individual spiritual health, the health of Schroyer Road, but it's bigger than this. We're talking about the Western Hemisphere. We're talking about the new world that people founded and longed to go to. And even today, across the globe, there are many who would even risk their lives to come to this place called the United States of America. But here, where we all can have access to the Bible, where we can go to church freely, where we can have really meetings together even in the midst of a pandemic. We are becoming biblically illiterate. And our views are becoming more shaped by the world than they are by God. So I'm concerned, and this is why I'm preaching a portrait of a healthy church. It's not just about Schroyer Road, it's not just about me, but it's about the whole church and what's happening across our land. Well, it begins with me, it begins with you, getting serious about God, getting into His Word, and allowing Him uh, to shape our lives. 
Today we're in 2 Timothy, if you'll turn in your Bibles. And I've entitled the message today, A Healthy Church Develops Disciples. And when I'm done, you're going to understand why it's so important in relationship to George Barna's research. Because I would argue that the reason so many people are now believing things that were never a part of evangelical churches, they believe them now because they haven't developed into a disciple. They come to church, they carry a Bible maybe, they give offerings, they go through the motions, but somehow the American church is not investing in the development of Christ's followers. And so this is where we are today, and I'm looking at the book of 2 Timothy. Uh, this particular book is a book about discipleship. It's a book about the Apostle Paul discipling Timothy, investing in a young man for the purpose of that man growing in his faith. Do you know that is not happening in most American churches? We have lots of programs, but those programs are not producing disciples that are mature. And so we've got a disconnect in our churches. Will you follow along as I read just a small portion of the text, starting in chapter 1, verse 2. To Timothy, my dear son. I love that. I love that. My dear son. He's not talking about a biological son. He's talking about a spiritual son. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve as my forefathers did with a clear conscience, as night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers. Recalling your tears, I long to see you, so that I might be filled with joy. I've been reminded, Timothy, of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded it now lives in you also. For this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of hands. For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but he gave us a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. And then chapter 2, verse 1. You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others. Join me in prayer, please. Father God, as we open your word this morning, we pray that your spirit will take the words off the pages of our Bible and bring them to life. Make them clear to us. Fill them with the passion they deserve. And Father, I pray that you will work through this servant to speak your words. Might I decrease and you increase for the glory of God, I pray. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. A healthy church develops disciples. Well, we go back to that core missional verse in the Bible. Before Jesus left planet Earth and ascended back into heaven, he looked at his disciples and he said, Now you, my disciples, go and make disciples. So I would argue that making disciples is at the very core of what a church ought to be about. It should not be peripheral. It should not simply be a part of a program. It should be who we are and what we do. But I look at calendars of churches today, and they're filled with meetings and, and activities and programs, but little discipleship is taking place. Remember in the book of Titus where they talked about uh, older men 
ministering to the lives of younger men and older women into the lives of younger women. And I think of couples investing in other couples. And I think of individuals coming alongside another individual over a long period of time. That's making disciples. But we got to start with honesty. We're not there. We're not there in the American church. Most churches that I've encountered in the evangelical community even do not have systems in place to develop people from infancy to maturity in Christ. Now they might say, well, we have a Sunday school. Well, let's look at what's happening in a traditional, typical Sunday school. We have people investing lots of time Lots of curriculum, lots of expense, but we're not seeing the fruit of mature discipleship. Well, I hear churches say, but we have a Wednesday night Bible study. Well, good, that, that's a good thing. But we're not producing mature disciples, and so we have to kind of be honest about it as we look in the mirror and say, whatever we're doing, is it really working? Is it effective in producing the kinds of disciples that Jesus wanted us to be? What kind of disciple is that? It's a fully devoted follower of Jesus. That's our goal. Schroyer Road Baptist Church here in Dayton, Ohio, with all of your history, that's our goal. That's why we exist. To give God the glory by embracing His mission to make disciples. And even Billy Graham, late in his ministry life, talked about the sadness in his heart as he reflected upon all of the crowds that came to the altar in those large stadiums and they signed a decision card but we're no longer following Jesus. You see, it's easy to raise my hand. It's easy to say, yes, I believe, but it's another thing to be a fully devoted follower of Christ. And the American church has to get back to this core mission that we've lost. Even the more modern contemporary mega churches oftentimes are missing the boat. Uh, we can become so busy attracting people to a church service that we lose sight of the fact of why they're here. What are we going to do with them now that they're here? We need to take them on a journey to grow them up. You know, sometimes I hear pastors today and I think it's a contemporary, trendy thing. They talk about, well, you know, I'm messy, you're messy, we're all messy, we welcome you to our messy church, come and you're going to feel comfortable here because we're all in a mess. My friends, somebody has to offer a solution. Somebody has to say, yes, life is messy, and yes, I was a wretched sinner, but I found Jesus, and I stand on a solid rock, and no, I am not perfect, but I have found answers to the difficult problems of life, and there is hope beyond the mess. I don't want you to just come and we'll all sit around and commiserate. I want you to come and be elevated to the next level of your walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. So Barna simply reinforces what I have sensed and many have known for a long, long time. The American church is in trouble. We are not as healthy as we ought to be. In fact, we're much further away than we ever thought we were. And it's time to get back to making fully devoted disciples of Jesus. Let me ask you two rhetorical questions. Number one, has anybody ever discipled you? 
I mean, they've come alongside you intentionally and invested in your life and poured their time and their energy over a period of time into your life because they cared about your spiritual growth. Question number two, have you in turn come alongside somebody else and invested your life in them? for their maturity. It's not happening in the American church. How do I know that? Because I contact hundreds and hundreds of pastors. I've been in many churches. I ask this question over and over again. I have asked deacons and elders, who discipled you to become an elder? And the answer is almost always no one. Well, we're in a crisis, but there's a solution. We can come back to the core values of the Bible. We can let go of secular ideas in terms of they're the answer, they're the solution. And we can come back to the mission of the church and we can invest in people. There's four words that I'm going to share with you today that are going to help us to make fully devoted followers of Christ. The first word is investing. Investing. To Timothy, my dear son. Those are words of investment. You don't call somebody my dear son unless you have gotten into their life. Unless you have come to know them. Unless you have built a trust Unless you have spent a lot of time with that person, you don't say, my dear son. Paul loved Timothy. He loved him enough to say, come along on my missionary journeys. Come along and watch me. Follow Christ as I follow Christ. Follow me, Paul says, as I follow Christ. And so Timothy walked on those missionary journeys with the Apostle Paul. He stood by his side. He had opportunity to minister to others under the watch care of the Apostle Paul. But by the time we come to 2 Timothy, Paul is near the end of his life. He is sitting in a Roman prison cell. He has time on his hand. He's simply a number in the Roman Empire. So he could be there until he dies. He doesn't know how long. And when you're sitting in a prison cell, that clock turns slowly. And he's thinking. And he's thinking. And he's remembering. And who's in his mind? Young Timothy. My dear son, I thank God when I remember you and I remember the tears that flowed between the two of us, probably when they said their last goodbye, I love you. And I care enough about you to invest my life in you. And so the letter of 2 Timothy is written as a letter of investment. I want to teach you. I want to challenge you. I want to raise the bar of your life. In other words, Paul was taking the baton of leadership and handing it off to Timothy. But he didn't just say, here's a job, I want you to be an elder in the church. Good luck. I'm glad you did it, because no one else would. No, he invested in him over a long season. And then he hands off the baton in 2 Timothy. Isn't that what Moses did for Joshua? How about Elijah and Elisha? Isn't that what Barnabas did for Paul? And now Paul is doing that for Timothy. And friends, we need to do that for others. My challenge today to Schroyer Road members and attenders is this. Find somebody, somebody that's a young believer, or maybe they're not even a believer yet. 
somebody who is not yet along the journey as far as you are. And I ask you to pray about it. And I ask you to open your mind to the possibility that God might be leading you into a relationship where you can invest in them. You know, we're busy. When I arrived at the last church that I pastored full time, we made an arrangement with the leadership of the church that I would do this kind of investing. And I said, do you really know what you're asking? Because I know how this works. And so we had a long conversation about what that would look like, and in the end, we decided, under their approval, to grant 25% of all of my time as a pastor would be to invest in individuals for their maturity in Christ. And so every week, I would fill my calendar with times meeting with people one-on-one. -on -one. And then I began to challenge our people at Grace Church to do the same. Twelve years later, by the time I left, you could walk into the lobby of the church on any given day, and you would see people seated at tables, one with one, praying, studying together. We created a whole new culture in the church because we got back to the mission of the church. We set aside certain programs. We stopped doing certain things that were traditional things of the church. And we started getting back to the business of the church. And I tell you what, when you invest in somebody's lives, it makes a big, big difference. It makes a difference in you, the one who's investing. Isn't that true? Have you ever gone to the hospital to minister to somebody who's sick and you come away blessed? That's the way discipleship happens. When I invest in you, I come away enriched and growing in my walk with the Lord. But investment is costly. It's costly. And we talk about investing money in the stock market. We talk about investing in material things. We talk about investing in our marriage. We talk about investing in our children. These are all important and wonderful things. But it's time we get back to the essential thing of investing in others that they will become a fully devoted disciple of Jesus. I tell you what, we can come here every Sunday for the rest of our lives and be just where we're at today. Or we can come and we can begin to invest. And then over time, dividends are paid. And then over time, lives are transformed. And then over time, those mature disciples are making other disciples. And pretty soon, there's no room <laughs> to keep all the disciples. Isn't that a neat problem? I don't have to do anything magical to fill this room. I just have to get back to the mission of the church. It's not about filling a room, it's about transforming a life. One life at a time. The second word is the word encouraging. If you are making a disciple, you are an encourager in their life. Do you need encouragement? I mean, who among us does not need a balcony person? Sorry, Janet and Charlie. <laughs> For today, you're our balcony people. Uh, Jill Briscoe, a pastor's wife, Stuart Briscoe, you might know him, Elmbrook Church. Uh, Jill Briscoe wrote a book in which she referred to balcony people. But she was talking about people who are your cheerleaders. And we all need that. We need somebody in our life who's going to say, you can do it. But we need somebody in our spiritual journey who will come along because they are walking with the Lord and they can say, you can do it because he is your strength. You can do it because he will never leave you. You can do it because of the promises of Scripture. You can do it. We need that. 
And the pandemic, if it hasn't shown us anything, it has shown us how vulnerable we are. It has shown us how weak we are. It has shown us how much we need one another. Making disciples is really connecting with others. To get out of myself and actually invest in you. To encourage. How did Paul encourage Timothy? Well, if you look at chapter 1, verse 6, he said, fan into flame the gift of God that is in you. That's an encouragement. Timothy might not have realized to his fullness what God has gifted him with. I remember when the first person ever told me, you know what? I'm really learning something as you teach this class. I had never heard that before. I kind of filed it away in no man's land and never really thought much about it. And then another Sunday came and a parent of a young child came up to me and said, I don't know what you're teaching my child, but please keep doing that. I would never heard stuff like that before. And these people were encouraging me. They were telling me that I see in you a spiritual gift. How do I know what my gift is? It's because you tell me. Huh. Uh, let's get real. This is not mysterious. This is just uh, a practical reality. Uh, I will know whether I'm a preacher or not a preacher by you. Uh, that's how I know. You didn't know you were telling those messages, but that's, that's how we know. We, we know our effectiveness when we do. When, when we do something and we see results and we see God working and changing in people's lives, we see that. Timothy was a young pastor at the time that this letter was written. He was probably 28 years old. Uh, and he needed that encouragement so that he could go to the next level in his journey. Notice chapter 2, verse 1. My son, be strong. That's encouragement. I challenge you to be strong. He goes on in that chapter to say, be strong like a soldier. Be strong like an athlete. Be strong like a farmer. Timothy, reflect on these things. I want you to be a strong leader in the church. And then in chapter 2, verse 15, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman, who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the Word of God. Timothy, I encourage you to get into the Word and handle it correctly. Chapter 4, verse 2. Preach the Word. Timothy, be prepared in season and out of season. Correct people, rebuke people, encourage people. Do it with patience. Do it with careful instruction. I'm encouraging you. Now, I want you to understand something. Biblical encouragement is different than what we often think encouragement is. We think encouragement is when someone makes me feel good. I'm just saying. We see encouragement when somebody makes me feel better. That's not biblical encouragement. Biblical encouragement is understood with a shepherd's staff. It has a crooked end and a straight end. The crooked end is the gentle tug, you know, pulling you out of the thorns, helping you from danger, I love you, I'm nurturing you. But there's a straight end to that staff. And that's to prod you and to get you going. What Paul is doing to Timothy is he's tugging at him and he's prodding him and he's challenging him to move to the next level of health in Jesus Christ. That's the kind of encouragement we need. I don't, I don't just need to be surrounded by people who are just going to make me feel good. I need people who love me enough to tell me the truth. 
I need people who are going to love me by investing in me. Talk is cheap. We can say, I'm praying for you. It's all over Facebook. I tell you what, if everybody who's praying on Facebook is praying, <laughs> I tell you what, our churches would be overflowing with transformed lives. We don't need just words. We need biblical encouragement. And that comes one-on-one. -on -one. Somebody coming alongside us and caring about us. Let's begin a journey of doing that at Schroyer Road. And we can do that in the midst of a pandemic. It might be different. It might be more challenging. It will certainly be more inconvenient. Um, but hello, isn't that the journey with Jesus? It's almost always inconvenient to do the hard things he's calling us to do. The third word is multiplying. If we want to make fully devoted followers of Christ, we have to do what chapter 2, verse 2 says. The things that you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, I now want you to take all that, and I want you to go out and invest. I want you to find reliable men, women, young people, who can do the very same thing. You can pour your life into them so they can pour their life into somebody else. Right. The modern church in America is measured not by multiplication, but by division. I'm just, I'm just sharing a hard fact. I have heard more sorrowful stories of churches going through trouble than I would ever want to hear. <clears throat> the American church has normalized division and it has no clue what it looks like to multiply. It's time to multiply. It's time to take my life and invest in you. I have six grandkids. I now have three foster grandkids. So there's nine. Uh, Tuesday, I'm going to go babysit half of these, all the foster kids and three others, uh, two others. And um, I see that as an opportunity. My daughter-in-law said, thank you for always saying yes, for being there. And I said, hey, that's why we moved here. Uh, we didn't move here to sit and open our wallet and look at grandkid pictures. We came here to actually one-on-one -on -one sit down with our grandchild and pour our life into our grandchild. Why? because we want them to grow to maturity in Christ and pour their life into somebody else. And you know, it's not always easy because sometimes they do things you don't like. And sometimes you get upset. And sometimes it is messy, but just stay with it because they're your grandkids. That's right. And so sometimes doing church is messy. Sometimes we make each other mad. Sometimes we don't do what others want us to do. But that's family. And we stick it out and we work it to go to the next level. The next level. We're always going to the next level until I stand before him face to face on level ground. But I'm not there yet. And so I'm going to challenge Royer Road to take it to the next level by investing, by encouraging, and by multiplying into the lives of others, and then finally by finishing the race. Look at chapter 4 and verse 7. Paul says to Timothy, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. I did it. I'm done. Five years after I graduated from my undergraduate Bible college, five years later, my cohort group of pastors to be had dwindled down to two of us left. And I don't know where the other one went, so I can't say for sure. I don't know whether he's still in ministry. But the dropout rate among pastors and among lay Christians is really high. People who have had enough of it and for whatever reason, self-centeredness or anything else, they chuck it. Lord, I want to finish.
finish well. You know, anybody can start a race. It takes people like you and me to declare before a holy God today that we're going to finish that race. It doesn't make any difference, pandemic or not. It doesn't make any difference of what comes into my life that I don't like. It's my devotion to God. It gets back to what? Consecration. That's what I've set my life apart for. I'm not going to change on a dime just because I didn't get my way. I'm not going to change on a dime just because it's rough. I'm not going to change on a dime just because now my calendar is filled with medical appointments suddenly. You're still my God. The mission is still to make disciples, and I'm going to make disciples. I'm going to invest. I'm going to encourage. I'm going to multiply. And I'm going to finish this race for the glory of God and the building of His church. Christ said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not stop it. I just want to be a part of it. I want to be a part of it. And I am deeply, deeply concerned about the American church. And I am deeply, deeply hopeful that if we get serious about God and consecrate our lives fully to Him and develop fully devoted followers of Jesus, this whole thing will turn around and we'll see God glorified again in the Western Hemisphere. The lands where we used to send missionaries are now sending missionaries to us. What a shame when there's a church on almost every corner. Let us not just be another building. Let's be a movement of God, I pray. Father, we commit our soul to you today. We're yours. At the very depth of our soul, we're yours. As the deer pants for water, so my soul longs for you.